What's up guys, this is Jimmy with High Fly Strength Systems and today we have Eric Helms from 3D Muscle Journey and he has an immense amount of credentials to be talking about the subject which we will be talking about today. He's currently working on his PhD, specifically researching some auto-regulation and auto-regulative training for powerlifters, which is the sample subject. And he, I mean, I could list his, his credentials on and on. He's got a CSCS, he's working on his PhD. There's so many things, he's got a million references for experience so that's why i figured we'd interview him today and so what we're going to be talking about is the current state of the fit fitness industry where it was about 10 years ago and what we'd like how we'd like it to look like in the next 10 years from now so eric what did the fitness industry really look like about i think 2003 when you started in the first place getting into the fitness industry for sure. Yeah, yeah. So um, I've been, in, as you said, roughly a little over a decade. That's probably 2005 is when I was actually working in commercial gyms as a trainer. Before that, I was doing some work with the Air Force. I didn't really get a look at the kind of the big picture. But yeah, you know, the uh, the fitness industry is very cyclical. And um, in many ways, it was similar. But the in one big way that I'll get to a second into in a second, it was similar. But of course, the faces of this cycle were different. You know, the um, NASM uh, personal training certification was new, so all of the, the types of training and um, you know your functional unstable training, your uh, postural assessments like the FMS and others were new, um, and you know nutrition was going in fast cycles like it is today. All of that stuff. But probably the um, the big thing that was similar to today was that. Um, and this will probably be similar to a degree always, is that there is very much um, a focus on learning rules right. for, 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 for fitness. Um, you know, you see the, the top 10 list today or the 15 things you must avoid or the 10 best exercises for blah, 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 yeah. or the five worst foods you can eat, all that stuff. It's uh, kind of this, you know, this idea that, that a guru in the fitness industry is someone who memorizes a bunch of rules and knows how to apply them in every situation rather than actually understanding why and how to do things. Right. And uh, I think that's probably the biggest issue in my right. mind. Right. So, so that was kind of like what it was like then and kind of now, but why was it exactly that you decided to go into the fitness industry in the, fir uh, in the first place? What, what attracted you to it? That's a great question. So on a more positive note, I do think that the vast majority of people even when they may use or promote uh, information that is not the best um, or even sometimes could be harmful, um, I think the intention behind most people is that they want to do better. Um, sometimes you kind of hear people talk about like, oh, the snake oil salesman in the fitness industry. And to be fair, there are people out there, you know, especially in like the supplement industry um, who are really don't care about anything except money um, or people who are pressured by a regular publication that they have to, you know, put stuff for, for just kind of recycling right. bicep training articles. I mean, that's very normal. Yeah. Um, but yeah, what attracted it to me is that it's a lot of positive people trying to help people and um, doing something that I really just fell in love with as an athlete. Um, you know, so it, it was a very easy uh, kind of community to fall into. It's generally a uh, pretty cool place but you know there's there's also a lot of issues with it like any in industry right so it seems like there's a lot of cyclical stuff that you're talking about so what did the what were the general fads around the time you did you joined the the fitness industry yeah well the uh in nutrition like i said things cycle very very quickly and um the i think at, at that time i remember being in debates around whether or whether or not uh you know high carb low fat diets were um, you know, the end-all, be-all for athletes, even back then. I remember there were early debates with uh, Palumbo and, and other guys in the bodybuilding community. And, and, I mean, we have to remember that the Atkins diet started a way back, even though there was re there's a recently a resurgence of the high-fat, low-carb uh, discussion. Right. Um, yeah, I think a lot of the – in the, the, there was rumblings in the um, – in, in kind of the, the – the, the natural bodybuilding community, which was where I've always been in my niche, um, around doing things with metabolic adaptation and metabolic capacity and all that stuff. This was stuff that, that Dr. Joe, you know, trying to 
you know, using refeeds or, or slowly adding in carbohydrates as you go into a show, eating up into a show, all this kind of stuff was, um, it was kind of like the secret knowledge that only a few coaches had. And, um, and it was way before, you know, things kind of uh, blew up around the debate around metabolic damage, you know, right. that, that got popular on YouTube. Right. But again, like I said, cyclical. Um, yeah. So it's just more of kind of an awareness thing rather than a different topic. So that, that, that's nutrition. Um, this is before carb backloading. This was uh, all before all that stuff. You know, carb cycling was was still, you know, very something that people were interested in. Um, and um, and let's see, you know, in training, West Side Barbell was, was very popular. Um, and I think bodybuilders were just starting to get aware of, of its existence and you know, we're curious, just starting to get curious about strength training routines. Yeah. That's kind of the early 2000s was um, bodybuilders going, periodization, what? You know, kind of. Yeah. Thing. So, okay. Yeah, that's about where things were at that time. So, since you've said, obviously, it's, it's cyclical, um, what, what, do you, what kind of things do you think are kind of reemerging from then? Or what, what is new from when you started to what it looks like now? And what are the, maybe the general trends that you see today? Yeah, I would say on a positive note, there is a lot more traction that has been gained behind actually understanding the uh, the rationale behind things, the theories behind things. Uh, the fact that that guys like myself have a voice in the fitness industry is is very encouraging. And um, you know, I'm I've, I've got a pretty good physique. I've, I've got pretty good numbers, but the there was certainly an idea in my head early on that until I was, you know, incredibly strong or just looking absolutely ridiculous physique-wise, I would never have more than a very small voice. Um, and that that has changed, and you can very much uh, promote yourself based on just the veracity of your critical thinking and your ability to write and put out good information. Um, where previously it had to do only with your ability to market yourself. Um, and surely that's still important, but, um, you know, the popularity of people like, uh, you know, Brad Schoenfeld, Alan Aragon, you know, Lane Norton, uh, Greg Knuckles, you know, I can go on and on and on that these, the, the, almost the rise of the, the evidence-based fitness guru is very interesting because the, like, surely that was there, but it wasn't, it wasn't to the same degree. That wasn't just such a clear path then you could just go and get there. You just knew that there were these standouts. Like, they're all, oh, you know, ignore everybody else. You listen to, to Lyle McDonald and, and Alan Aragon. That's a very common thing that, you know, we used to think of back in, right. in the early 2000s. But they were the standouts. They were the, the anti-guru. They were a totally different kind of animal that um, just had what it took. They had some of the same characteristics as the popular guys. Like, you know, you wanted to listen to them, good writing, um, and, and uh, you know, good critical thinking and a very intelligent application of these theories. But at the same time, they were on it as far as the, uh, the scientific uh, perspective. And um, I don't know if people really thought about emulating them, but that is where I came from, whether I realized it or not, and where a lot of um, other voices in the industry have. And, and now it's just a very much a, a clear path. Right. Which is pretty cool. So now that we've kind of talked about what it's looked like, what it looks like now, what what would you really like to see the fitness industry going in the next 10 to 15 years? And what, I mean, ideally, what would you, we can talk about nutrition and then training as well, but ideally, what would you look like the next 10 to 15 years of the fitness industry to look like? Well, I, I think, I think uh, it's almost the same for both. Um, the, there's a big kind of like the, the, the pendulum that, that, that swings in, in the fitness industry. Like, um, the more that the the evidence-based crowd thinks black and white, kind of like the same way that the, uh, the the fitness industry tends to lean towards in the first place, the more there will be a big pushback against it. Um, and you see that now, like the, the term PubMed Ninja. That only exists because people um, almost are, are, there are, there are a group of people who are almost paralyzed and won't do anything or think everything is crap if there's not a citation they can put behind it. Right. You know, forgetting that, that, that research can only tell you about population means and that if something hasn't been researched, it doesn't mean it's crap. It just means it hasn't been researched yet. Right. Uh, and understanding that uh, research that tells you what's best for 66% of the group that they studied is not necessarily the same thing that's the best for you right. or I. 
Um, the only way to tell that is the way it always has been is by doing rigorous self-testing and you know trial and error, experimentation, trying different programs, trying, trying different macronutrient combinations, etc. Um, and to not simply just throw the baby out with the bathwater. So I think the main thing I would like to see changed is that the mentality of the scientific method, you know, being open-minded, not attached to your own belief so much, even if it's scientific method is the only way to go kind of thing, and um, being open to other people and, and speaking in a respectful way and, and not thinking in just kind of a black and white system um, would be the, the only dogma I would like to promote it, to not have dogma. You know? Right, right. Awesome. Well, that's, uh, I mean, we can obviously go into a lot more detail, but for the purposes of this video, I think this is exactly what we're looking for. And I really uh, appreciate that you're able to get on call with me and just talk about something simple like this, because it really is something that's important to the way that we're able to look at the fitness industry in general. And especially because even this population you're discussing, where it's evidence-based, it's still relatively small, but it's like we're surrounding ourselves with that that community. So it's easy to feel like it's, oh, it's everyone just understands that evidence is um, more important than anecdote. But there's also this huge group of people who still don't even understand basic nutrition and basic pro programming principles. So that's kind of the purpose of this video is to talk to you about, you know, that's not always the case. So I really just want to pre uh, thank you again. And maybe next time we'll be able to interview about something if you're not as busy with your uh, PD, PhD work research. And I'm really, really interested in seeing what you what you learn from that. And I uh, can't wait to see that you have a PhD to add to your your plethora of other credentials. <laughs> it's well, awesome. Once I get the PhD, I can just ditch all the all the other letters. It's all important <laughs> Don't ones, even right? include those. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, man. Well, um, I hope you guys liked this video. So if you did, please rate, comment, subscribe.